hey, thanks, thanks everybody, and and more than anything, I have to extend a big thank you to Keith for uh, for being this accommodating. I know this is not typically the way uh, Wireless Land Professionals Conference is designed for somebody to be doing it over WebEx. So I just again a big big shout, out, a big thanks to Keith for that. Um, just maybe a, a a second of background so you can understand why we're doing this remotely. Um, uh, of course, I was there last year and was it very much looking forward to being there this year. Um, and for those of you that know me, I'm an avid cyclist. And uh, back a few days after Christmas, I was coming down a hill, pound away. And uh, long story short, uh, the evasive move I tried to make was not successful. And uh, I hit the ground, broke my hip, and I'm not terribly mobile right now. So here I am doing it from my desktop. So uh, um, that's, uh, that's pretty much the story. So with that, um, the topic today that we wanted to cover was, was of course, about packet analysis because that's what we do here at Wild Packets. Um, but, but more specifically, you know, what it is about, you know, packet analysis for wireless land and, and why there are times you need to actually look at packets. There's many, many instances where uh, packets are really the only way to solve a problem, and that's really the focus here. So, looking at some some common problems from some relatively mundane things to maybe just some somewhat more complex things. Uh, in, in terms of how we can solve problems by actually dissecting the packets. Um, I will, uh, you know, it's a soft apology, but I'll apologize up front. Since we are looking at packets, we have to look at packets with something. So uh, I'm going to use my, my favorite packet analysis solution, which is OmniPeak from all packets. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it, this is not about OmniPeak so much as it's about looking into the packets themselves. You can use whatever tools you normally use. Uh, the methodology might be a little bit different, but the concepts are are the same. Uh, and the goals then are really kind of threefold. Number one, it's it's to to solve these problems by looking at packets, by knowing where to look. Um, you know, and and a, a tertiary thing is, you know, if you if you are an, uh, an OmniPeak user, um, you'll get a little bit of a feel for the way we would do it from within OmniPeak. So um, kind of all all three things kind of rolled into one. So so with that, um, before getting into the the ten things. Uh, I just wanted to take a second, maybe a few more than a, maybe more than a second, a few seconds, to talk about some of the critical elements of a packet analysis solution, regardless of what solution you use. And, and there's even some caveats around using you know, our own solutions, you know, in these areas. So to capture the packets to solve the kinds of problems we're looking at right here uh, is getting more and more complicated as we get to to higher and higher speeds. So you know, the first critical element. That I want to talk about is is performance, and performance takes many forms. Uh, it, it depends on the horsepower of the laptop, you know, or, or whatever you're using to run the software on. Uh, it might involve, you know, because most of us are probably still going to use USB devices today to do this to capture the packets. It's going to rely on the performance of that USB device itself, um, how capable it is. Uh, whether it's N, whether it's AC, whether it's two stream, whether it's three stream, whether it's single stream, all these factor in very much into into that performance side. Uh, and as as things get faster and faster, uh, it might be uh, a situation where uh, you need to do less analysis of just capture the packets first and do analysis after the fact uh, so that you can get better performance out of things. Or it might mean that there's some filtering that needs to go on up front. Uh, if you know you're looking for certain things. So um, it takes many forms. The idea of this presentation wasn't around performance, but I just wanted to, to put that out there so that it's always something that sits really top of mind for people to think about, uh, you know, how the, the software, whatever software you're using, is going to be performing uh, and its ability to actually capture the data that, that you're expecting and that you're interested in seeing uh, for part of the analysis. A second critical element, though, uh, you know, especially in terms of the, the, some of the cases we're going to talk about today, is about being able to capture uh, things, multiple channels at the same time. Um, there's really, you know, several, there's two approaches, really. Uh, you know, in this, uh, very often uh, in, in, a, in a packet analyzer, somebody will use a single USB device uh, and, and put it into a scanning mode. Um, certainly a, a, a very applicable use case. Uh, it, it serves many very useful purposes, but when you're really looking to do uh, packet analysis, especially packet analysis where, where every single packet on a channel is going to be important to you, like maybe where you're analyzing roaming or other things, uh, 
and you're not doing something that's just statistical, being able to capture all of the packets on each of the channels of interest is critical. And that's what we mean by multi-channel analysis. And that typically means needing to use multiple USB devices to do that. Um, you know, certainly, OmniPeak is capable of doing that. You know, others are as well. You just need to keep that in mind and make sure that that's part of your solution as well. Uh, visualization is also key. You know, we're going to see that as, as part of what we go through in, the, in, these, uh, in these cases today. Um, I, I think that you know, probably most of the rest of that goes without saying. Uh, the different types of analysis modules also important. Um, the, the, if you're collecting the packets, uh, you always have really all of the analysis kind of at your disposal. Um, and you're doing that, that mentally if you have all the packets. But the more automated that analysis can be, um, the better. You know, the, the, maybe the way it can analyze timing or relative time or the way it can analyze roaming uh, and different things like that. Uh, analyze maybe s s statistics or information that's applicable around uh, voice, if you're doing voice over Wi-Fi, uh, anything that can be included in that uh, analysis solution uh, to make some of that a little more automated so that you're not really having to pour through every packet unless it's absolutely necessary is, is also pretty critical. Um, and lastly, it's, it's high-quality decodes. Uh, a lot of what we're going to look at today uh, right here has to do with actually looking into packet decodes. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of detail in there. Um, you know, any, any of you who have you know, used any sort of packet analysis solutions, you know, are probably aware uh, there are occasionally problems in decodes. That's true for, uh, for us with our solution and it's really true for any solution, um, you know, but the quality of those decodes are, are what's, you know, what's important and, and the ability uh, for people to be able to respond, uh, you know, if there are issues in the decodes. Open source stuff like, like Wireshark. Um, you know, very easy. You probably don't modify those decodes yourself, you know, and or, uh, you know, record it in and, and very quickly somebody will, will update the decodes to work. Um, you know, we try to be also as, as responsive as possible, you know, from, from our own perspective. But, but uh, the quality of those decodes, again, is, is very, very important. So, so that aside, let's just jump into what, is, what are these 10 common problems we're going to look at today? I just, these are 10 Common problems from my perspective. How did I come up with these common problems? Uh, really, a little bit of it from experience. Uh, some of it from uh, looking at people's blogs, maybe uh, blogs from some of the people that are, that are in the room there. Uh, you, you will see as we get a little further on, uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, problems where I didn't actually have the packets for. Um, and I, I found those use cases uh, in some blogs by uh, Ben Miller. So I have some screenshots. Uh, from his blog that I've used to, to identify uh, those particular common problems. So uh, try to look at it from a number of perspectives. Again, our, my own experience, other experiences as well um, that I've heard from people. And again, it's just it's just the 10 that I chose. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's innumerable reasons why you would want to be able to do packet analysis to solve wireless lamp problems. Uh, not every, you know, statistical uh, you know, graphical solution is going to be suitable for doing uh, true root cause analysis with, with wireless LAN issues. So uh, the first two are around just verifying device capabilities. So they're going to be very straightforward, you know, kind of, you know, maybe they're not even problems, but they're, they're ways to, to verify if there is a problem. And it's looking uh, at things like, you know, problems on the network versus problems with clients and verifying the capabilities of those devices. So those are the first two. Uh, and these will become more clear, of course, as we talk about them. The third one is about, you know, verifying a device configuration and maybe looking for uh, poor configuration choices. Uh, again, needing to look, you know, into uh, packets and even into the packet decodes to see these things. Uh, the fourth, uh, a very common problem, still comes up all the time, uh, is around authentication. Uh, so we'll look into uh, in a little bit of detail um, the the EPOL authentication and the uh, the four-way handshake that goes on there and what that looks like from a packet uh, point of view. Uh, the fifth one is around uh, voice over Wi-Fi quality. Uh, maybe not uh, common from the past, but becoming much more common. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about a, a few of the metrics that are used behind uh, voice quality and, and how to get those uh, uh, by looking at packets from a packet perspective. Uh, the next uh, three are around identifying network bottlenecks. So looking at things like chatty clients, um, you know, kind of out-of-control probe requests, uh, inefficient network utilization, 
uh, and, and talking more about that and how we look at that again from a packet perspective and identify not only that the utilization might be inefficient, but you know how it is inefficient and how we can go and address that. And and lastly, um, roaming, uh, a very common problem right now. Um, things like sticky clients, uh, probably the most common thing you find uh, talked about. This probably has probably already come up often, uh, in, maybe in other presentations there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, and also just about general roaming latency, uh, and again, just how we see that from a packet perspective. So those are our problems. So let's uh, jump right in. First, to, to verifying just the device capabilities. Uh, so for network capabilities, the first thing that, that I would do, if I was to verify, to ver, verifying device capabilities, is I would just go look at beacons for, uh, for the access points that are there to see what it is they're advertising as a network capability. And from a client perspective, what I'd look at are the probe requests to see what they're uh, uh, advertising uh, from that perspective. So uh, you just do a quick, uh, quick switch here and uh, go share OmniPeak. And hopefully that also comes up okay. Um, so to, to, in terms of the, from the network perspective, um, I'm going to use mostly uh, trace files here that, uh, that I've saved from, from the past. And uh, this particular uh, file is, uh, was actually captured with a Cisco AP. It's, uh, it's got some one, three, one stream and three stream 11 AC traffic in that. You can probably see that uh, in what's up there on the decode. But again, this first example was just around, you know, what would we do in terms of looking at uh, a network capability? Uh, and if we were looking at it from, from the network side, again, what, what I would do is uh, first and foremost go in and look at the decodes for uh, the beacons themselves. So um, to do that, uh, I might first go into protocols, um, highlight the beacons, and then do a select related uh, for just the beacons and put those into a new window makes it easier for me to deal with just the beacons, right, and see a little bit more of what I have to see. And once these beacons come up, we'll see that there's really only two access points in this file that are beaconing. Uh, there's the 04B9 and the D870. And we'll say we don't know much about these. So let's go look. Let's go look at, we'll look at 04B9 first, right, and see uh, what it seems to be. So we've gone into the packet itself. So now I would get down into the decode already, right, and what are the, some of the first things that I would want to see? Well, but the packet info stuff, you know, that stuff we're generating on our own from there. That's not really what's important to us in that header. For this particular uh, uh, example is not really that important. But what we want to do is, is go down and look more to our supported rates. So we see under 802.11 management, you know, it is a beacon. Uh, a little further down, we see our supported rates. So we know at least we're supporting through one in 54 megabits per second. Uh, so we know we're at least in, uh, you know, a, a G uh, type mode. And we knew from, from early on, I'll go back up to the top, that we were on uh, channel 36. So we know it's in the A range, um, and that's what it's reporting. And then as we scroll further down, we see we've got, you know, some more information, the, the, the communication map, et cetera, um, country WPA, and then we're at the end of the packet. So what this looks like to me very much is this really is just a, a, a G client. Uh, we're going to the 5 gigahertz band, uh, only going up to five, 54 megabits per second. And it's, it's exactly what we have with this particular access point. But let's contrast that with the one, the next one down, the D870. So we'll go into that packet for more detail. And number one, I went by kind of fast, but it's a much, it's a much larger packet, uh, even though it's a beacon, than, than the first beacon because there's a lot more information in here. So going down to that first area, our supported data rates, we, of course, still have our, our 1 through 54. It's still channel 36. That's all still the same. But as we scroll further down, uh, we see a whole area now. Uh, I'll start at the top. It's the, the HT capability, right, the high throughput capability. So this describes basically our 11N capabilities. And we see there are 11N capabilities here. We have up to three streams of 11N traffic all the way up through uh, MCS 23 supported. So um, we know now we're at uh, up to 11 and 3 stream. And if we go further down, um, we can see there's beam forming that's supported. And for much further down, I'm, I know I'm giving a lot of stuff, not all of it, 
is relevant. Um, we're going to get to extended capabilities and then this very high. So we see here at the top uh, where Swole does have very high throughput capabilities. And now uh, we're looking at basically that, that's the, the code name for the 11AC support. So now we see from an 11AC perspective also um, that we have support and we'll be more specific. Now we can see what is supported, right? Um, STB is supported on the transmit side. Um, the short GI for 160 or 80 is not supported, basically because uh, that channel bandwidth is not supported at all. We see that here. There's no support for 160 or 80 plus 80. Uh, but we have the short GI for 80 megahertz. LVPC is supported. So we can see a lot of the capabilities that, that are there in 11AC are supported by, uh, by this access point. Uh, we get further down, uh, and we, we can see um, all of our other capabilities here. We knew early from earlier on. We were also three stream. Um, you know, and as we get down to the MCS map down here, uh, we can see we have support for one spatial stream, two spatial streams, three spatial streams of 11 AC. So uh, again, by, by digging into those beacons, we're able to very easily see what the capabilities are from a network perspective. So that was, you know, the, the first of our cases, and we kind of pulled a few tabs as we, as we go down here. So uh, secondly, um, the idea was from the client perspective. So um, again, to do that, let's go back to our uh, our overall protocols, get our, back to our list of protocols. And the best to look there uh, is really from a probe request. And we see we have some probe requests here. So um, let's do anything we did before, highlight a probe request, and, and do a select related packets, bring those into a new window. And we're going to see we have a lot of different, you know, probe requests in here. Uh, I'm going to focus on um, 53B8, which is a station that I happen to know. So we'll go look at the probe request for uh, for this particular station. So um, similar, we're going to look for similar things uh, that we look for with the beacon. So uh, we see as we get further down, again, we have our supported data rates, uh, channel 1 through channel 54 as you might expect, and then we see the high throughput capability, again, which is you know, the covert for 11N support. Um, and we see there one spatial stream support through MCS7, but no support for spatial stream 2 or spatial stream 3, which we did see in the access point side, right? And then you know, further down into our, our you know, very high throughput uh, in code name for 11AC capabilities, uh, you know, we see that same thing where we have a supported MCS index for one spatial stream, but not for two or three or any of the other spatial streams. Um, you know, other similar support, no support for the 160 bandwidth, um, support for 80 megahertz with a short GI. So now we know the capabilities of our client. Is it's an 11 AC, uh, up to 11 AC one stream client. So, um, you know, again, do you always need to do this? No, but in cases where you really need to verify you want to make sure that things are set up absolutely correctly, or that you really don't know the capability of something, you can dig into this level and see exactly what the capabilities uh, are. So go back to uh, our desktop. So the transitions are a little slow. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, it's about verifying some of that device capability. So maybe looking for uh, whether or not quality of service is enabled or disabled, um, looking at things like beacon intervals to see if that's, you know, verifying that level of configuration, and, and looking at some other specific frames like uh, um, clear to send frames. Uh, because sometimes they can be manipulated, uh, and maybe uh, maybe there's some configuration problems there. Uh, specifically, a common problem or a problem that's been seen uh, is when CTS frames are sent out with uh, the wrong durations set, uh, and they can be viewed as a duration attack. So uh, let's take a second looking at those. So we'll come back and show around the peak again.
All right. So the, the first one, I'm going to use the same file that we were just using. So we know we have a, a network that's three stream 11 AC. We have some clients that are one stream 11 AC. Um, but what I, what I want to look at first out of those is uh, those clear send frames. So again, good way to start is down to protocols, uh, go down to the, uh, to, oops, sorry, I didn't need to click there. Uh, I meant to right click. So uh, the protocols and then file and then right click, select ready packets. So these are relatively simple, right? So all we want to see here is we want to come into those, you know, clear sends uh, and and look at our duration field. So here it's at 104 uh, microseconds. So these are not the kind of packets that we were just, you know, worried about where they might be set to, you know, 10,000 uh, microseconds, that kind of thing. But it's exactly where we'd come to check. Um, but one of the other um, neat things about doing this is you know, maybe you don't want to have to go look packet by packet to check. You want to be able to kind of quickly scan. So the nice thing about that is we can come uh, back into our uh, packets view. Actually, let's let's go get back just those uh, clear sense for a minute. Um, come back here and back to our clear sense, uh, and then come back into our our packet view. And one of the columns that we have uh, set within, uh, certainly at least within OmniPeak that's handy, is this column called the decode column. We have it set it's all the way on the right-hand side, uh, the arrow kind of circling around right now with something called decode. And, and I have it set right now to the duration path. We can set that to any value that we like. Um, you know, I could set it to the receiver channel. I could set it to... Um, uh, you know, what type of pack it is, et cetera. Um, but we set it by just going into the, the decode area in the bottom left-hand corner and clicking the particular field we're interested in. So we click duration, and, and then we can just quickly see in that column, it's going to, you know, report the value for the duration in that column for each and every one of those clear to send packets, which, is already, which we've already filtered down to. So you can just quickly scroll through um, and, and look for any sort of anomalous behavior, and, and none of it looks strange, right? It's all in the the 100 to 200 uh, microsecond range, everything looks good. But it's a very quick way to be able to address that problem of potential misconfigurations in a clear to send kind of packet where the duration might be misset. So uh, there's one of those examples. Uh, second example is around quality of service. And for that, I'm going to go to a, a different file. Um, pull this down a little bit. Um, and get my bearings here. And again, in um, in in uh, looking for quality of service kind of things, where we're going to go to uh, first again is to beacons. So we would come in and we would uh, again select the way to attack as well as beacons and copy this to a new window. And here we basically have one access point. And it's in the capability info for uh, for a beacon pack and under, under AOT development management and then in the capability info right here uh, where we see quality of service. And right here, um, you know, at uh, seven or eight bits down, quality of service is not supported. So uh, we we would know in this particular case for this access point that at least it is, right now it is configured for it not to be supported. We don't know yet if we need to go back to the, the, the access point itself from a manufacturer standpoint to know whether or not it can be supported, but certainly it's configured right now to not be supported. So uh, another area to quickly go check in terms of configuration. Um, and then lastly, um, the beacon intervals, uh, you know, also something important to check. And, and something to note here as well, because we've had questions come in about this before. So you can see the beacon interval. Uh, it's also under that AOT.11 management beacon right above the capability info. And we see there that it's set to 100, and you might think that's 100 uh, you know, uh, milliseconds, um, but it's 100 time units. Um, and I um, forgot to go check exactly why, but 100 time units 
uh, what that conversion is. Well, you can see we do the conversion for you right here. 100 time units is actually 102 milliseconds and 400 microseconds. So um, it's 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 really um, a, a very odd 102.4 uh, milliseconds is what the actual beacon interval is, even though you set the beacon interval to 100 because you you think it's 100 milliseconds. So just a you know kind of a little fun fact there. Uh, we've had that question come up before. Uh, why? why we're reporting it that way. It actually is true that is really the way it comes across because these are actually set as time units. But again, this beacon interval is, is important. Uh, you might want to check that the beacon interval is correct. You might want to see it across a number of different access points. And we could do, uh, again, that same thing by uh, coming in and we have uh, the decode right, this column set, right? And we have it on, on the, the beacon interval right now because that's what we were looking at was the beacon interval. And you know we can then scroll down again and see if these were a number of different access points, we would be able to see if any of our access points were, uh, were beginning at some different rate uh, that might be more inefficient on our network. So um, again, a, quick, a very quick one there. So let me come back to the application again. So getting into you know saying a, a little bit higher level now where we're not just looking into the decodes but where it's a, a series of packets you know one of the next uh, you know probably very common problems is analyzing issues around uh, connections and authentication so uh, right here we're just going to focus on you know authentication um, really for, for, from you know in terms of in terms of connection just the authentication part of connection and really that has to do with the the equal key exchange, and it's really a four key exchange. So, and I, I forgot to credit this. I'm terribly sorry for that. I normally put a link on every page that I do where I get something from somewhere else. But this actually does come uh, uh, come from uh, Wikipedia, and I should have been clear about that um, and, and put the link. But this is this is from Wikipedia. That's where this the little diagram came from. So you can see the station and the AP. Uh, you know, and the AP starts out by sending uh, an odd value to the station. And the station then sends one back of its own along with a MIC. Um, and then the AP sends the DPK again with we'll another MIC. And then, and then the station confirms all that back to the access point. So these are, these are all done in equal packets. Um, and I brought, I put this detail here because that this is the, these are the details that you're going to see the subtle differences between the individual packets because the packets look very, the, each of the four ePoll packets look very, very similar. So let's, uh, let's come back up and uh, come back to sharing uh, OmniPeak. And I thought I did that. There we go. So here, uh, let me see, let's use yet a different file. Um, and again, we'll start in that same way. And we've started the same way every time, but uh, since a lot of this we're looking at right now is protocol-based, it makes it much easier. We'll come back to that protocols view, uh, and we'll look for our, our um, EPOL packets. And they're here, and right-click. And then select with the packets, pop into the window. And the first thing you'll notice is, you know, I said there were four packets, and well, here we have five packets. Um, okay. Um, also, always, of course, one of those things to look out for, um, and depending again on the solution you're using. Uh, and, and we can see this when we look more specifically into the packet, but for that fifth packet right here, um, you do see there's a, a flags column, the flag, that particular uh, uh, packet has the flags column set with a plus. And uh, what that the plus means, uh, it means a retransmission. But if you don't know that, we can always come in, click and see flags, and we see right here that packet errors, uh, a plus sign indicates a retransmission. So. We do know this truly still was a four key exchange. Uh, it's just that the last packet in that exchange was actually retransmitted. So we have already have one, uh, you know, one of the, the small questions here uh, about this equal exchange, you know, answered for us. Um, but as we, we talked about, um, 
it's really that first packet is really, you know, the, the uh, you know, we'll get our source and destination. It's really the, um, the access point is the source, right, which uh, initiates to the, uh, to the client, which, uh, which there is a, that, um, the lithium tech. So we see that that's definitely confirmed. Um, and as we scroll down in this packet, um, the key areas in here are in the 802.1x authentication area, specifically the ePoll. Um, and you can see what we said in that first packet, what was going to send out the key in once, and there it is right there. So we can see that key being sent from the access point uh, to the client. So then we go to the next packet. And first to verify that it's going in the other direction, yet here the source is the client, and, and then the, uh, the destination is the access point, as we had earlier. Uh, as we saw earlier, that's the direction it would be. Uh, and then we see, again, there is another key set, and it said this time it was going to send a key uh, MIC, and there, there it is right there. So, you know, it's the second of our packets, key once, and the key MIC. So, so far, uh, it looks like we have uh, a proper uh, ePoll key exchange. So let me come to our third packet. And again, this was going to be uh, from uh, source as the access point, destination right as a client. So we see that again there. Um, and then uh, this was going to send uh, a different MIC. And granted, I didn't ask you to remember the MIC from the last one, uh, but this does have actually a different MIC in it than the last one. So this uh, a same key MIC, and there we go. So we know we're still uh, going in the right direction here with that repo. Everything seems to be successful. And then lastly, it was going to be an acknowledgement back uh, from uh, the source, from the, uh, from the client uh, to the access point. And that's what we have here. Uh, and uh, uh, there we go. Everything has been exchanged. Uh, everything is in place. Uh, but we do know in this particular case um, that this packet was actually retransmitted. We don't know why. This packet looks good. Um, it's showing a good SCS. It's not showing any errors. But when we go to our, our fifth packet in here, We'll see it looks exactly like the last packet, except under the frame control flags, it says this is a retransmission. So we know this was a retransmission. We did report that earlier on in the, the higher level view with the plus sign. So we know it's a retransmission of basically the same packet that we saw before, but it's now completely, uh, our, our key, eco, epo, uh, key exchange is now complete, and we've been able to look through and verify that this key exchange has happened. So, you know, in a, a more typical, you know, way we might not dig into each and every one of the packets like this, uh, but certainly, you know, for any given client, uh, we would do things like we've done with that select related, boil it down to the ePoll packets that pertain to a particular client, and just like we see here, we should always see uh, just, the, you know, the four packets. And if we don't see four, we see something less than four packets, we know we have an ePoll exchange, uh, key exchange. If we see lots of retransmissions in those, we know that could be a problem. So. Uh, again, verifying uh, you know, in a very specific way uh, exactly what's going to happen uh, in terms of authentication uh, from, from that key exchange perspective. Okay, so let me go back to uh, slides. So now let's look a little bit about poor VoFi quality. So again, something else that's at a higher level and uh, uh, maybe not you know, digging right into all the packets right off of that. So we know that voice is becoming more and more common uh, on Wi-Fi network, especially as we're going toward uh, 11 AC and the ability to be able to analyze that, that voice uh, over Wi-Fi, especially from a quality perspective, uh, is extremely important. So um, back up to... Back to OmniPeak. In this particular case, I'm um, going to uh, close a few of these tabs for us so we don't get too twisted around. But uh, um, we're going to open up this uh, file here. To, uh, I know it's a vote by uh, call. Um, and one area where we can see that uh, is, is we have an overall voice and video kind of uh, dashboard. But that's not really you know, the first thing we would see. Uh, let's say we didn't have this level of analysis, but, you know, saying different levels of analysis is important, but if we didn't have any of this, all we had was packets. Um, you know, we can, we can always go into our packets view or back into our protocols view 
and there's certainly things that we'd be looking for if we were looking for uh, voice over Wi-Fi. We, right, we'd be looking for um, you know either RTP packets or uh, specific forms of RTP packets like uh, G.711 packets, which we know is a, a common codec for voice over Wi-Fi. Uh, of course, we know there might be some SIP packets, some SIP exchange, depending on what's being used. This um, done by Cisco, uh, Cisco access points, and then uh, some RTCP, which is uh, um, so real-time control protocol packets, right? There's always a little bit of that as well for the call setup. So we know even from a packer perspective without anything else, uh, we're certainly looking at some uh, uh, some voice over Wi-Fi kind of traffic. Um, we can see those protocols. Um, another area where we might come from, because there are certain things for, for voice that we know we're going to be worried about. Um, for voice, even more so than for data packets, we're going to worry about things like uh, packet loss and uh, latency and jitter and those types of uh, uh, metrics. So one of the things that we know we can see from our stats are things like uh, packet loss. So we can come down and, uh, uh, and, and look at the overall packet loss here. Um, it's one of our, in our voice and video area, we can see we have total packet loss right here, 3.85%, uh, um, a little bit high for packet loss. Uh, we can see in our stats that we've accumulated, uh, there are some other important statistics from a voice over IP, uh, in this case voice over Wi-Fi, but generally a voice over IP perspective, mean opinion score, uh, and this comes in multiple forms, a listen, listen quality, a call quality, conversational quality, a predicted quality. Uh, this is normally a rating that goes from one to five, and you see we're in a, you know, three-ish kind of range, maybe a little bit better for that predicted quality, not the highest quality out there. And also our R factor, which is a zero to 100 rating, you know, kind of in that 60 category, again, not really uh, the very best. So uh, we know we could have some, some issues from a VoFi uh, perspective and from a quality perspective. Um, if you have that, the, the, uh, you know, more detailed voice over uh, uh, IP, or voice over Wi-Fi uh, analysis capabilities available. Uh, that helps even more. Uh, in this particular case, we know with at least in, in this application, we're able to, to bring uh, all these voice packets into a single view where we can look at it from a single call perspective. So this is looking at the overall call, basically the packets going from the caller to the callee, back from the callee to the caller, and it's giving us you know, a summary below of all the statistics for that call. Um, we can come up here, right click, and go to a visual expert for that call, where we're now gonna see uh, basically a bounce diagram, uh, packet by packet, for that call. So at the beginning, and again, we're still dealing with packets, right, and it's packets that are gonna tell us our answers. We can see how well the call setup went. Uh, we see in the first six packets uh, that that's what it took for us to do the call setup. So these are all RTCP packets. And you can see that, you know, we, we uh, uh, an invitation, so basically it rings and there's authentication required and there's an acknowledgement, uh, an invitation, it's trying, it accepts. So we know that. And then packet seven, packet 13, um, we see the types of uh, uh, technology that's being used that is G.711 new law. And then when we get down Packet 17 and 18. What these are, these are actually compilations uh, in, in this area right here of the rest of the call itself. So we see a little um, a, um, a, a little spark line for the call. Uh, areas where we see drop packets with those little red lines underneath, um, you know, in areas where we see some gaps, uh, a little spark, uh, spark line graph of jitter and a spark line graph of the, the R factor. So you know, we saw that R factor was around 60 in there, and that's kind of what we're seeing here in the 60 kind of range. And we see that in the middle of that call, we had a huge jump in our jitter. Um, you know, point here wasn't to explain everything about voice over IP, but real quick, what jitter is, that jitter is about the variation in packet delivery from packet to packet. Uh, and we can go look at that in a little bit from a packet perspective. But uh, voice over IP and voice over Wi-Fi tricks a very regular delivery of packets into the handset, typically 20 milliseconds, uh, and, and definitely 20 milliseconds for G.711. Um, we can see that jitter uh, varied tremendously in the middle of the call, and that's very likely uh, the, 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 the reason for the, the quality problems uh, in this particular call. Uh, one other view 
in, in this is also our uh, uh, media view where we break it down the call into each direction. Each direction of a call can vary a little bit in terms of uh, the different metrics. So, you know, all of that from uh, that packet perspective. Um, you know, if, if again, if we only had packets, we could go back to just the packets themselves. Um, and once we get, uh, you know, past the SIP and get into some of the G.711, you know, one way to analyze things like jitter, if you, if you don't have um, uh, something that's already calculating that jitter for you, is to, to, you know, look at the packets like we are here. You can see we're going back and forth, call it a colleague, call it a colleague. Um, you know, what I would suggest is we, we just uh, um, go in one direction. So right click and then do a select related, uh, maybe just by source. Um, so now we're only going to see uh, the packets from the source side. And the reason for doing that is we want to get to where our delta time uh, is a little more meaningful to us. So um, you know, we can look down the, the delta times, like maybe right from this stretch right here, where all the packets are going in one direction. I mean, we see still that delta time is jumping all over the place. We wanted a 20 millisecond right, delivery. Right? We see we, in this last, last packet we get 20 milliseconds, but sometimes it was very short. And at one point we had what looks like a three second delay uh, from one packet to the other, and that's back at the beginning of the call. So, um, you know, here we had a 20, here we had 19. So we're looking pretty good with that jitter, you know, but then here, you know, it's not. And, and here we had some very quick packet delivery. So again, this is where we know our jitter is kind of jumping around. Even without uh, advanced analysis tools, we can use simple packet-based analysis and things like just using a delta time column to be able to analyze things like jitter for us. Uh, so, let me see, we'll go back to one week. So now we're slide back, so we did. Uh, so now identifying uh, network bottlenecks. So, uh, these are some areas where I did not have the packets um, and just wanted to highlight, you know, some uh, some problems. And these are problems that come from um, from Ben Miller from his blog and uh, some problems that, that he had seen over time and that he had used packet analysis uh, specifically to help solve these problems. So the first has to do with um, the chattiness of uh, certain clients, whether they're associated or unassociated uh, with a network. So. Um, you know, the general I idea here being that, uh, and, and these may not exist anymore. Um, these were, you know, some, some Apple and, and other, uh, you know, types of uh, basically, you know, uh, mobile phone kind of products. Um, but, you know, the difference between, look, looking at the difference between when something is, uh, is unassociated, right? And what we're looking at here uh, is when this, when this uh, is unassociated, you know, you might think that, okay, it's not really using up bandwidth on, uh, on my wireless network, but of course it is. It's sending a lot of you know probe requests, and it's getting back probe responses. And you can see um, that two things to, to pay attention to. Number one, the data rates, and I, I can't highlight anything in these, but you can see the uh, the fifth column over is data rate. These are all being sent at one megabit per second, and the size of these packets is all you know, relatively large. They're not tiny packets, so we can see we're taking up some significant uh, you know network bandwidth. Uh, just because this phone is unassociated and constantly searching for a network. And we can contrast that against when it's associated, right? Now here, uh, it may be, you know, maybe it's sending or not sending data. We got some null data going back and forth. Uh, but again, now it's sending these at some higher data rates. Now at least the null data is being sent at 24 megabits per second. And these packet sizes are very small. Instead of being in the hundreds of bytes, they're in the tens of bytes. So. You know, we might think, you know, and it, it was, you know, this was, you know, again, these are problems that we solved with, with uh, packet analysis, but, you know, from the, uh, from the past, you know, the thought might have been, well, because my, uh, my devices are not associated with a network, I'm using less network bandwidth. And what packet analysis shows us is that might necessarily be true at all. Um, down at the bottom is the link to, to, uh, uh, to this particular blog where Ben had these, and he does some math in there to even show uh, the the impact of the unassociated client. You know, here we're showing one unassociated client. Uh, think of this from the perspective of, uh, well, the Super Bowl, which just happened, or just so any other large venue like that, where you now have, you know, tens of thousands of 
mobile devices, you know, in that arena, uh, you know, in that stadium, uh, all at different levels of being associated or not with a network. Uh, and you can see how it, very quickly you could have some very significant impacts on your network with, you know, relatively large packets with extremely, at, at being sent at extremely low data rates, like one megabit per second. So, and again, it's packet analysis that's going to be able to identify these types of things for you. Uh, another area is just inefficient uh, network utilization. Uh, and again, the idea here is, you know, you know what we're showing is uh, in this particular view, and again, the link to, to Ben's blog down here, uh, in, in, highlighted in blue, we had here, you know, a particular uh, highlighted element from the high throughput information where it says that we, you know, it's pure HT, uh, there should be no uh, protection involved, and, you know, everything should be running, you know, without any sort of power save or anything else. Um, and that's generally the notion here. Uh, but yet there were still some inefficiencies in this network. So uh, the idea was, you know, here that's what, that's what our, again, our configuration is showing back to actually going into the packets to verify the configuration of a particular access point. But then, you know, we get into the packets themselves and we see that even though, uh, you know, we're, we're in that particular mode, right, where um, we're in pure HT, right, where we shouldn't be requiring uh, any sort of protection. Here, what we're seeing and what he's showing is uh, when the laptop communicates, uh, still we're seeing, whoops, sorry, we're seeing, um, thought it was an omnipede. Uh, we're seeing, uh, RT, uh, you know, uh, request to sends and clear to sends, you know, as part and surrounding uh, these data packets. So, you know, here we are reducing the inefficiency of our network. We have it configured so that this shouldn't be happening, right? Yet, uh, even though we're sending the data at 300 megabits per second, we're going back to sending, you know, two additional packets at 24 megabits per second with, uh, with uh, control packets that should not be necessary in this particular uh, application. So, again, it is uh, packet analysis which allows us to be able to see that uh, by looking at the details of, of each and every packet. So I know I'm getting uh, close to the end here, but we're also getting close. Uh, so lastly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about roaming. And uh, two particular issues rise to the top with roaming, and we're going to go look at a file here about roaming in just a second. Uh, but, but first uh, is this notion of, of, of sticky clients. And I, I unfortunately don't have um, a packet file to, uh, to isolate or to illustrate the, the sticky client uh, uh, itself, but uh, I can explain it uh, through, the, through the packet file I do have and give you an idea of what that would look like. Uh, but the sticky client idea is that basically clients make poor roaming decisions. Uh, you know, and the, the, they often stay on an access point too long. That's the notion of that sticky. It's just going to hang on there, you know, when maybe it should have it should have roamed or transitioned, you know, a while back. And the things that you would want to look for uh, from a packet per sector with sticky clients are you know, clients where the signal strength is dropping very low on an access point, you know, before it actually tries to even, you know, uh, uh, look for another access point uh, before it starts doing, you know, probe, probe request, et cetera, to look for another access point. That's one of the things to look for. Look for where an access point, when its data rates are dropping dramatically, um, you know, when it should be operating, you know, at, at 300 megabits per second, and it's dropping well below that, dropping back into the, the BG kind of range is 54, 48, 36, even lower, you know, it, without, again, uh, doing probe requests to look for another access point to go to. That's the notion of a sticky client. But one of the key things to measure in roaming is that overall roaming latency. That's one of the things that really matters. Uh, and again, I, I, this, is, this particular diagram uh, came from a, a different blog, from the Revolution Wi-Fi uh, blog, and I it was just a great illustration of roaming, and of one of the things that we're often trying to explain to people, uh, because uh, Omnipeak does do some level of roaming uh, latency, it will analyze and, and list for you uh, in a log kind of format the, the roaming latencies that are being seen. But but roaming latency is uh, uh, is in the eye of the beholder, which is what this chart is trying to show. So um, you know we see list along the top there's the client. Get it again. Keep thinking I'm in the app. Uh, the client, the old AP the new IP that it's going to go to, right? And of course, you know, if it's doing 802.1x and authentication server on the back end. So, you know, we have a client and it's working with those old IP, it's sending data, everything is fine, that's at the very top. You know, it, it realizes maybe that that signal strength is getting low or its data rate is, is declining rapidly. 
Um, so it starts probing for another access point. You know, it, it, it gets, it finds a new access point where the signal strength and or the data rate or the combination of both is going to be better. Um, so uh, and, and then does an authentication against that association against that new AP. And then, you know, if it is 802.1 access and authentication back against the radius server, the key exchange for the down that we talked about earlier are four packets there. And then we finally start seeing data back from the new AP. So we can see there's definitely some latency that's generated in there. But, but what is that latency? What is that room time? Is it from when the authentication started to when the authentication ended? Or is it to where we first got data? Or is it from where we last sent data on the old AP to when we first sent data on the new AP? Or back from when we first started probing to the new data? There's many different ways to look at this. So uh, even though like uh, somebody may offer you um, a, a widget, a little analysis module that tells you what the latency is, that may not be the way you want to uh, analyze latency. So you could end up being back in a packet view, like some of the packet views that we've seen, looking at things like delta time between packets to actually measure latency your own way. So I just wanted to be kind of clear about that. So uh, real quick, I'm just going to go back to, uh, to OmniPeak. And I'm going to go into this uh, last file, this Roman file. And um, first, just to, to, to show you, you know, there are, if it offers a capability to analyze roaming, you might see that roaming in different ways. Uh, here's a log where we show it by uh, the overall log. So we see the number of rooms, or you can see it by node, or you can see it by access point. Um, but in each of these, see, so there was two seconds of latency here. So you might wonder what happened in that two seconds. That's way too long for roaming latency, right? So we might want to wonder what happened in there. So um, from here, we can just double click. Uh, it's one of the features of, of that particular widget where it's going to bring uh, just the packets uh, that are related to that particular room uh, uh, back into a new window for us. So um, here we go. In, in this case, first, this is where we can see, number one, where the two seconds came from and whether or not we agree in this style of room. So, there was a roam. Uh, in this particular case, the roam was detected on the basis of data seen on the last AP to data seen on the new AP. So it was one of the choices in our diagram, right? But maybe because we missed some things in between, or maybe just because it wasn't sending data um, for those two, they just had no need to send data for those two seconds, we get a two second roam time. But maybe the roaming time you know, wasn't quite that long. So um, that's one way to look at it, just from uh, from a, a, you know, like an analysis widget point of view. But let's kind of break it down a little bit more. So what we can do is we can come uh, back to our, our, our larger uh, packet file here and come into our, our compass view, which is a, a view that's just going to show us uh, uh, many different parameters about our network. Um, but uh, let, let's go look at uh, the particular client that was involved in the roam. And that happened to be 310A. Uh, find that here. It's right here. It's this guy right here. So these are all the packets uh, that this particular client was sending. So we're now looking at the client, and what we're looking at on the top graph is this data rate, and we see the data rate was declining rapidly for that client, and then there was a gap, and then the data rate jumped back up. So odds are that's where our roam happened, and and that is exactly where uh, the roaming happened. And uh, we can see that as well. Remember, remember, we're looking at a particular client. We can overlay that with channel information. So we may overlay that with the channel one at first. So we see our client was obviously on channel one, and then our client moved to channel 11. So very, very clear. We know that's where that roam took place. But let's say we want to see a little bit more about that roam. Or really, we just saw those two data packets. So we may just come in and zoom in on that particular area and and see maybe some of the packets were involved there. So when did it first start to, to probe? So we can say, where were our probe requests? Well, um, you know, oh, let's get rid of some of the others here. Let's get rid of that in the channel, and let's go back to our, uh, just our guy here. So where were our, our probes? Can we even see where those probes were? You can't, let's, oh, yeah, so the probe, here was a probe request. It showed up right, right there, right, where we first start seeing things. So. And then we can even drill in a little bit further if we want, uh, and then zoom in and see things more from 
a microscopic perspective. So we can see where are our probe requests, where were our reassociation responses, you know, where was that first web data. So we can really, you know, very, in a very fine grain drill in and see exactly what was going on. And we can see where that relatively long gap was. There really was a long gap here where it was sending data and gap and then started to do it, its, uh, its uh, uh, probing and, and then everything happened very quickly on this end. So if you went from, uh, from probe response, let's say, or probe request uh, to first data, um, to reassociation response to first data, that all happened very, relatively quickly right in this time frame. So just to show you again how that, that delta might be between those. So I know we're right up on 3 o'clock. My apologies for that. I did want to leave some time for questions, um, but uh, um, and we can still do that, but I know there's probably other sessions to go to. So uh, let me just hop back uh, really, really quickly and remind you of one other thing um, inside here, which is uh, if, if you're, you're interested in, in playing with, uh, with OmniPeak a little bit, um, inside the uh, goodie bag that you guys got uh, is a copy of uh, a one-year eval of OmniPeak. This all depends on, on whether you were um, uh, with us last year or not. Uh, if you uh, did your one-year license of OmniPeak Pro from last year from the Wireless Land Professional Conference, is a 50% discount this year on OmniPeak. Uh, but if not, uh, if you're new to Wireless Land Professionals Conference this year, uh, there is a, a one-year full copy of OmniPeak Professional uh, that you can install and use for the next year. So um, you know, please do that. Um, again, this is not about selling product, and I understand that, but I want you to be able to, uh, you know, play with packets and analyze uh, things in the ways that we just went through, um, and, uh, and OmniPeak will give you a good capability to do that, and you, know, you can kind of follow along with some of the things that I just did. So, uh, again, I want to thank you all for, for this opportunity. Uh, I will make the slides available uh, um, through Keith. And it, was, it was a way where we were going to we were going to do this maybe through SlideShare. Uh, and at the, at the end, I have a number of different additional resources. A lot of these were blog entries from uh, Ben Miller and a few other individuals, uh, where uh, you can go read about some of these different types of packet analysis uh, situations uh, and, and how packet analysis and a packet analysis uh, software product was able to help solve those problems. So with that, I want to thank you guys very very much. Uh, for entertaining me remotely. Um, I, I truly miss being there um, and, and, and truly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much.